Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Last First Date Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. Hello, everybody. This is Sandy, and I am a dating and love coach at lastfirstdate.com. I want to welcome you to Last First Date Radio. We are a featured show about attracting and sustaining healthy relationships. Every week, I bring you in-depth interviews with top experts and cutting-edge authors in the field of dating and relationships. Today, I'm going to be speaking with therapist and author Audrey Sherman about when you're in a new relationship with the same old baggage and how you can lose it for good this time. Such an important topic, and I'm really excited to get to it. But before I do, I just want to say that as a dating coach, it is my mission to help women over 40 become more confident and learn the skills that it takes to have a healthy, lasting, loving relationship. I have watched far too many women give up their value and accept crumbs of attention from men who treat them poorly, and that's why... I love helping women become women of value by letting go of the past and releasing their unconscious behaviors that sabotage their love life. I help them learn to trust their intuition so that they can open up their hearts and be more vulnerable and create deeper and more meaningful connections. I also help them to understand men because often we see each other through our own lens and we don't understand that men and women don't think and process in exactly the same way. Um, Also, a lot of women who are over 40 have forgotten how to really sink into the feminine. Um, they're so used to performing um, in, in their lives and, you know, over-performing, over-functioning, that their femininity has taken a back seat. So we also work on that. And, um, and, and one of my biggest passions is teaching communication skills, um, teaching women how to speak up about what they want and what they need because men are really bad mind readers And when you become a woman of value, you will inspire a man's commitment for lasting love. Every week I give a tip on how to become a woman of value, and this week's tip is to practice saying, no, that doesn't work for me. We tend to say yes even when we mean no. So if if you really mean no, say no, because the more you respect your time, your, your life, the more others are going to respect you. If you do want to become a woman of value who attracts her best partner, I invite you to head over to lastfirstdate.com and sign up for my brand new free guide, The Top 10 Reasons Why Men Pull Away or Disappear, and how you can finally attract and keep the love you deserve. Stop sabotaging your love life and start taking back your control by being a true woman of value. Today's guest, Dr. Audrey Sherman, is a psychologist, and she's an expert at working with clients who want to be free from emotional baggage that's keeping them from living a happier, more fulfilling life. She believes that happiness and hope can be learned. For almost two decades, Dr. Sherman has taught thousands of clients how to change their thinking and their habits. By using her program, Dysfunction Interrupted, people can better control their lives build healthier relationships, and feel good for life. She's the author of Dysfunction Interrupted, How to Quickly Overcome Depression, Anxiety, and Anger, Starting Now. Welcome to the show, Audrey. Thank you, Sandy. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. It's a great topic and definitely interesting to me and I'm sure to our listeners. Lots of people carry big, big suitcases of emotional baggage. Um, yeah. So let's let's talk about uh, the five most common types of relationship mistakes or choices that people make um, because of their emotional baggage. Okay. Yep, and there's five biggies that I'm sure you will recognize right away and your listeners will probably recognize as well. Uh, the first one that I see, I call, and I'm sure I'm not the only therapist who calls it this, is the white knight syndrome. Um, When we tend not to know our value, when we 
give over our value or if we have just become a chaotic kind of mess, I'll call it, um, sometimes single moms with full-time jobs, anyone who just finds themselves really struggling to get by, that white knight looks really good. And often he appears, he offers to fix things, he may be financially uh, more sound than we are in that moment, um, and he just kind of swoops in and he looks really good and we get caught up with him. And the downside of it, I mean, that all sounds wonderful, but the downside of it for anyone who's been involved in that kind of relationship knows that white knight needs you to be the chaotic mess. Once you're no longer a chaotic mess, once you know your own value, once you want your time respected, uh, you no longer work for that person because he wants, he needs, his ego needs for you to need something fixed. But when he's no longer able to fix it and you're on your own two feet and whatnot, the relationship tends to start to go downhill. Um, The woman usually ends up resenting his need for control. And what looked like um, a nice, stable guy all of a sudden kind of now looks like a control freak sort of person that we no longer want to be with. Um, And Mm. so that is one, you know, and that usually comes about when we're dependent, when we don't trust ourselves. Um, or if uh-huh. we are in some kind of a pickle, that kind of guy looks good, but it, it usually doesn't work out. It's, it's not a long-term f- fix. Um, so that's one yes. of those problems. Um, I've definitely dated one, him. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I um, think we all and I have. Think, you know, <laughs> right. But, and, and I think you know, the, the vulnerability that many people find themselves in, especially after a long-term relationship ends or you're in a bad mm-hmm. way, um, these guys look amazing and you're really blindsided by them. So it's really important yeah. to know that um, that it only works when you're vulnerable and chaotic and a mess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's that's when that kind of works. Um, the, the next type is, is a more blatant type, the abusive. Um, and not so much, well, I mean, there is the physical abuse piece, but there's also that kind of insidious verbal abuse, emotional abuse kind of person. And when we come from dysfunctional paths where we're, if we've been emotionally abused, we are more desensitized to it. And so we don't recognize right away that it's happening. Um, someone who has not been abused or has never, you know, it, has never experienced that, if a person says something to them that's even a little sideways, they get a red flag and they end it immediately. They say, hey, no, I'm more valuable than that. I'm not going to be spoken to like that. But someone who's endured, you know, any sort of previous abuse, sometimes is, their tolerance level is way higher and their their recognition level is way higher um, that they don't understand when it's happening until they're already kind of sucked up into it. And mm-hmm. so that is the next, that the next kind that we tend to uh, fall fall into with, and you know, usually that is from low self esteem. It's from a history of any kind of of abusive relationship in the past. Um, even you know just par- parents telling us you know you're not going to get anywhere in life, or who'd want you? I mean anything, you're dumb. Anything like that, we tend to mm-hmm. then gravitate toward the abusive types. Um, and the next one that's kind of it's similar, but it's the controlling. Type, someone who just takes over and will do everything. And when we are dependent, when we don't trust ourselves or know our value, we that looks good also. It's kind of like the white knight, but a, a little more negative. He doesn't swoop in and seem good really even in the beginning. He's just a control nut right from the start. Your time, um, obsessed with when you call, when you don't call, you know, all of that sort of thing maybe comes on too strong and wants to be in a relationship way too fast um, and that sort of thing. So most people see it, you recognize that something's a little off, but it might feel good. Again, if you're Uh dependent, you know, that that kind of a personality to start with, then that might look really good to you. Um, The next kind is the uh, codependent, caretaking sort of relationships that we get into with people who are a mess themselves. And when our baggage tells us that uh, we're not lovable, that no one would want to be with us unless they need us, then we become the caretaker. We become the codependent. We clean up their messes. You know, maybe they don't have jobs. 
Um, maybe they're addicted to something. Maybe their family's a mess, and you have to always be involved in dramas and crises and fixing things. Um, and that's, you know, that's the self-esteem. It's the baggage saying, nobody would want you if you didn't do this. If you, didn't, if you weren't involved in all this, he wouldn't love you. But again, we really don't want to be loved by that kind of person because they're life suckers. Uh, but uh-huh. that's another uh, pattern we get stuck in. And then the last one, the, the last most common one that I see is when, we, when our baggage is con- consists of attachment disorders that we gain either through childhood or young adulthood, early relationships, um, we tend to be drawn like a magnet to narcissists or to other individuals who are emotionally neglectful. And there's just something about that dynamic that, that again, are drawn to each other like magnets. Um, an anxious attachment means that you're never fully secure with the person that you're with. You always feel like you look for clues or that they're going to leave or they're on their way out the door. And so maybe you always have a foot out the door thinking, well, I'm going to leave before they get a chance to leave. But it's a terrible, anxious way to live and the person who is emotionally neglectful kind of senses that, and they pull back to cause you that torment. And so it's, it's a very bad dynamic. Um, uh-huh. Narcissists are, you know, they're famous for being emotionally neglectful or just not able to be there uh, emotionally for you. So those are the five major negative relationship patterns that I see based on people's baggage. Mm-hmm. Those are biggies, and I get so many women who come to me with these things with these with this kind of baggage and and men too i i got an email this week from a man who wasn't even dating this woman but he became completely hooked on a woman who was very neglectful unkind inconsistent um he's wondering if she's a narcissist and i said doesn't matter i mean she's not right. a nice person you need to get away right. like everybody wants that label just tell me just tell me if it's a narcissist and first of all i can't i can't diagnose someone um but i certainly can right, diagnose them by them. email um mm-hmm. you know and it's it's it, it and it all stems from this you know place of low self esteem and um mm-hmm and a sense of dependency. And, you know, what was interesting to me when I got divorced was I, I started reading about how to have a healthy relationship and how to stay away from dangerous men and dangerous relationships. And um, and I came across a book that talked about um, how these how we start dating these kinds of people, where it begins. And, um, and growing up in a dysfunctional home, it really normalizes abnormal behavior and and it was like a real mm-hmm. eye opening moment for me because I see people who know the line in the sand, you know the ones who grew up usually in a more healthy environment know that this you don't cross this line with me. they have those mm-hmm. standards but but most people don't you know and i I'm sure you found similar um, kind of evidence in in the people that you um, are working with. Yeah, yeah. That like you said, that line in the sand, those boundaries aren't clear. Mm-hmm. And until they yeah. learn to draw those, it's very hard. But once they do learn, and I'm sure you've experienced that, once they do learn, they feel so good, and they're mm-hmm. they're pleased with themselves. And they, it's just uh, it is a transformation. Just that boundary piece. Yeah, I, I wrote a book about boundaries with a co-author um, because it's oh, such an important part of my practice. Yeah, it's it's just mm-hmm. so important to um, to to set clear boundaries, to know to know yourself, to love yourself. You know, it's it's uh, it's amazing how many people are suffering from low self worth. Yeah, so, it's you very know, sad. and it's. It yeah, but it also changes your entire life. It's not just about dating, obviously. You know, mm-hmm. it changes it changes how you are with friendships and how you are in your job and in your family mm-hmm. relationship. Um, so let's go back to where it does begin um, because we're talking a little bit about the past. And so, um, yeah, so can you talk a little bit about where baggage begins? It Typically, for I, I think for most people, it does... Bo- it, it starts in childhood. There are the folks who make it through a wonderful childhood and just have a really horrible 
um, first-time relationship experience, and that can do it also. But for the most part, I find that my clients um, tend to have experienced some sort of a dysfunctional background right from the get-go. They've either been out, just outright, they've experienced either outright abuse, emotional or physical, um, sexual abuse, uh, whether by a family member or someone else, really, really gives someone a, uh, let's say, a skewed look at their self worth, and they have a, they have a real struggle trying to to come back to themselves and figure that out and how to have then a, a healthy relationship. Um, even a depressed parent, a parent that's not there for them emotionally to, to talk over feelings and to make them feel like their feelings are important, if they always feel like you know, go away, I'm tired right now, I can't talk, or if the person is not available, what they learn is that their feelings aren't, you know, that important, they shouldn't want to talk about them, um, they're just kind of bothering people by wanting to talk about them, and you can see the problem with that going into a, you know, a husband-wife or a significant other relationship, but that's not going to work if you don't feel like your feelings should be addressed. Um, there are parents who are substance abusers, whether it is alcohol, drugs, prescription drugs, and typically they aren't emotionally available either, um, or the home is just a, you know, a chaotic mess. And so the child learns that, okay, you know, we grow up in crisis, one crisis after another. And so when they get out, they meet people who are like that, and it feels comfortable to them. They feel like, oh, yeah, I get this. I know this. This is how I grew up. But again, mm-hmm. that's, it's hard to sustain that, that kind of a, um, a mess. Uh, there are parents who are high functioning parents who don't do all the abuse and drugs and stuff like that, but they are what I call the invalidating or the poo poo parents. And that is when a child goes to them with a concern like, oh, you know, somebody bullied me at school today. And the parent is like, yeah, you know, suck it up. It's, it's uh-huh. not a big deal or <laughs> something. And it is a big deal to the child. It doesn't mean you don't teach them how to handle it, but just telling them that it's it's nothing, you know, like poo poo, it's it's nothing, teaches the child that their feelings don't matter. So again, then you're back mm-hmm. in that kind of cycle. Um, yeah. So there's there's many ways. Those are some that I find, you know, are the most the most common kinds of things. The chaotic folks, mm-hmm. the emotionally neglectful. Um, that's where it usually starts because the message is you don't matter, you're not valuable, your feelings are stupid. Um, here, just let me do that for you. You know, never, never mm. teach them to do on their own. That's how they become the dependent mess that goes for the white knight. Um, mm-hmm. you, you can you can usually really start to see, and everybody's like, "Well, you can't blame your parents." And no, you know, it's not about blame. It's just about understanding, understanding your messages and how you're operating, so mm-hmm. that you can undo yeah. those messages. Yeah, it's not about blaming or staying mm-hmm. stuck in the past or anything. Yeah, because that can be really harmful to you, um, you know, and it's yeah. just you have to let go. You have to be able to have some compassion also for the fact that your parents probably did the best they could, even if it yeah. was very limited. Um, and mm-hmm. it, so what, what's really curious to me, and you touched on this a little bit, and I can I can totally relate to everything you just said, but the the people who grow up in these homes that's, that seem wonderful, and I was Recently talking to, I I actually have a few clients who grew up in homes that they thought were perfect or, you know, just so loving and wonderful. And I remember hearing from one of my radio guests, um, Linda Carroll, who's also a therapist, um, that if somebody says that their home was either perfect or the most horrible in the world, like either extreme, Mm -hmm. that that's a Mm -hmm. red flag. Um, You know, that if you can't see anything, like you know, and so I was actually talking to this one woman who ended up in a very abusive, narcissistic um, relationship with with a person who was very emotionally and sometimes physically abusive. She said, "My parents were so loving. Um, they used to tickle each other in front of me. You know, very, very affectionate." And I started to like kind of pry a little bit about, you know, what. Did you talk about emotions? Did you, you know, because it sounded like they didn't really discuss anything of any importance um, emotionally in the family. Um, And so she kind of painted this picture of perfection, and I don't think it was 
by any means perfect. I think there was love, which is wonderful, but I think if you can't see that there are issues in every relationship, I mean, parents need to talk things out. They, you know, a healthy relationship is one where you discuss everything. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, so have you seen that also where people tend to paint a picture that's not even real? Yes, yeah. Uh, I've seen, and typically it's the very disturbed clients, like the ones who really, it's difficult for them. I think the fear is once you break open that dam of emotions, it's not going to stop. It's going to be overpowering to them, mm-hmm. overwhelming, and they're afraid. They're afraid to go there. So I kind of try to chink away at it just a little piece at a time um, because they do seem to be the just the most fearful of kind of digging into that. And they've painted some rosy picture. My parents mm-hmm. were fine. This, isn't, this has nothing to do with my parents. This is me. Um, and, and they just really don't even want to go there. And sometimes they get very angry if you even suggest that. And mm-hmm. that anger is a defense mechanism for them. And I, I do believe it's just based in fear that once that opens up, they may feel like they're going to be sucked up in it and not know how to handle the emotions yeah. that come out. I've seen that with a lot of people who are resistant to therapy. They, they're they so afraid mm-hmm. of uncovering and um, yeah. don't realize the value of, of actually looking and being honest and and looking within. It, it, there, a lot of people are afraid. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a shame. So let's once people do notice, they, they start to uncover what, what is at the root of their baggage. How do they stop? Like how do they how do they get rid of the baggage? What do they do next? Uh, well, what I do um, in my program and working with clients, what I try to have them, what we identify right off the um, bat is to look at these faulty beliefs, look at the messages that you were given um, as lies, that to learn to treat those missed messages, like say the message to you, I'll just use a very blatant one, like if, if the message to you was you are stupid, um, to, to learn to treat that as that's another person's lie coming to you just as if you were looking out at a bright, sunny day and a person says to you, it's raining. Well, no, it's not. And you can clearly see that. And although it's a little bit harder, it's not as easy to see, I'm not stupid, um, I really do a lot of reality testing with them to say, hey, let's, let's look at all the evidence that you're not stupid and be able to handle these mis- these terrible messages, these beliefs that we've been given by the people around us as just that liar who's saying it's raining when it's not. And so it kind of helps distance that. And once you can distance that, that liar, um, you can start to look at yourself a little more clearly. And I really like evidence. I think people like evidence. They want to see facts. Uh-huh. They want to see you know, well, what proof do I have that I'm lovable? What proof do I have of this and that? And so I spend time, we really look for proof, and I have them do exercises for that and stuff. Um, and then the next thing is to kind of stand, the, the next thing that I have them do is to stand back, not rush into another relationship, because typically the ones that we're drawn to immediately, the people that we meet that we have an instant chemistry with, are the ones that are the worst for us. And we are clicking uh-huh. with them just like, you know, we're, we're those magnets. We are the anxious person and the narcissist. We're the sexual abuser and the sexually abused um, coming together. And that click goes off for us. And we, we interpret it as, oh, wow, I have this great chemistry. But what it really is is just this huge familiarity that feels good because you're clicking with the same kind of person you've always clicked with or who has abused you in the past. So I ask that when you feel that click to just stand back, and not do anything. You don't have to act on it. You're not going to lose this person if they really are the right one. Um, but if they aren't the right one, you will lose them, and it's good. <laughs> so I, uh-huh. I do ask that, that they do that. I think that helps a lot. And the next thing is, you know, watching for those red flags, learning to identify the red flags, and then trusting yourself, understanding that your brain is a good brain, and it's telling you, no, this person, this is a red flag, drawing that line in the sand like we just talked about with the boundaries. Um and then just getting rid of them, no matter what we call it, whether it's a narcissist or an abuser, or it doesn't matter what he is, he just needs to go. Um, and change change our social venues to some degree. A lot of times we keep meeting the same people because we're going to the same places to meet them, and 
that doesn't always work. We have to expose ourselves to new kinds of people. Typically, we're hanging around with the same kinds of people, so we meet their friends. We meet, you know, or we're in a bar, so we meet other folks that are in the bar. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but just a lot of times meeting people in the same social venues, we always have met them and it doesn't work. We need to meet them in people who are doing activities that we like to do, hobbies, spiritual stuff, what have you, just something different. And then mm-hmm. the other thing that I that I like to have um, folks run out to do to make these changes, I call it the wash, rinse, repeat cycle, is just to understand that you're going to go through it a few times. Just because you maybe go to a new social venue and you meet a person and it doesn't work out doesn't mean that, that your new skills are failing. It just means you didn't meet the right person. And that's okay. We're, you're going to go through a bunch of them before you meet one that's that's the right one and not to give up and go back to your old means of doing things because it gets you, you know, five or six dates with someone. You're better off alone. You don't need someone than to use your old skills and wind up in a bad relationship. Hmm. So such good advice. Um, I, I, I love the, um, looking at the lies and beliefs that we are, the limiting beliefs, because I think people don't even realize where limiting beliefs begin um, when you talk about anything, money, love, um, self-worth, they all begin somewhere. And, um, and, and just to look for contrary evidence, I think that, you know, I, I, I got my mom up online on dating a couple of months ago, and she's 85 mm-hmm. And, oh, boy, all the limiting beliefs came out, like, right away. It was like, oh, he's a liar. Oh, he's a jerk. <laughs> this guy, he's not. And I'm like, you don't know any of these people. They're just a bunch of profiles. <laughs> you know, you need to <laughs> you need to ask some questions. You need to, like, maybe go out for coffee. Like, isn't that a concept? Actually get to know somebody and see what they're really like. Um, but it's it's like the old, you know, the defenses come up. The fears come up. The, um, you know, the, the push away. Um so it, it's. I see it with my clients. I see it with my mother. <laughs> it's like very funny. Mm-hmm. Um, so okay. So you've done the healing, and you've you've really worked on yourself. You've changed up where you're meeting people, and you know how to recognize red flags, recognize your emotional baggage. Now you want to really get into a healthy relationship. What do you do next? Well, I think you know starting with. Making sure, yeah, making sure you're beyond the red flags, making sure you're beyond all that, making sure that the person feels like a friend. You know, I think that that friendship piece is often what gets overlooked in a dysfunctional relationship. It becomes a need, and that friendships aren't based on need. Friendships are based in common interests and enjoyment of each other, those sorts of things. So looking, looking and making sure, like kind of giving it a friend test. Is this person, would I like this person as a friend, not just a a significant other. Um, uh-huh. I think that, that that helps a lot. I think the communication piece, a lot of times folks with dysfunctional backgrounds just carry their own dysfunctional uh, speaking and communicating patterns into the next relationship. And a lot of times it's very um, defensive or it's kind of dodging. It's always hearing what the other person has to say and then basing what you say based on that. And it's, it's a, almost a game. And learning to communicate directly and trusting that the other person will also do that. And if the other person's not able to do it or doesn't, uh, is not appreciative of direct communication, then understanding that's a red flag. Um, mm-hmm. So I think a lot of stuff comes back to the red flag stuff. But adopting for yourself um, the ability to communicate clearly to make sure your needs are understood. And I like what you said, men and women do often communicate entirely differently, and men are very bad mind readers. So you have to learn to be very clear, like I need you to um, you know, sit and listen to me for a little while without trying to fix something. I, I'd like you to hear my standpoint on this. Um, so having the, um, the self-worth, the self-value, to understand that your opinions are important and your emotions should be validated. Um, and that is kind of all p- part of that communication uh, piece. The friendship, as I mentioned, is huge. And then also understanding that trust is a big deal. And it doesn't mean that the person won't betray your trust at some point because things happen, that that happens. 
but going through life always waiting for the door to slam or somebody to be gone is a very anxious way to live. And it's better to fully put your trust into what you're doing in the moment. And if it doesn't work out, just kind of deal with it then. But don't spend all that time worrying about being betrayed, uh, you know, everything that snooping through emails, all the sorts of things that keep you unhappy in a relationship. And I see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I do too. I remember a client years ago who started to distrust her boyfriend and totally freaked out about something that she found that she didn't know anything about. She didn't check in with him. She just made a huge assumption right away that he had been in touch with an old girlfriend and he didn't love her and blah, blah, blah. It was like all her baggage just came pouring out. And Mm. I encouraged her to have a conversation. You know, it's the simple conversations that just get curious and ask instead of snooping and not Mm -hmm. trusting. And, yeah, I had a lot of distrust in my marriage that really eroded my marriage not not from me but from him like not being able to talk to men because he would not trust the relationship you know just any Mm -hmm. man that I would talk to um that's that's like a controlling behavior and it's Mm -hmm. you feel trapped I mean it's yeah doesn't work so um yeah I mean this yeah. Yeah, you don't want to walk on eggshells. You you want to build trust. Um yeah, recently mm-hmm. I dated somebody who you know, said a lot of amazing things on a first date, followed up right away, followed up the next day and then and then he kind of disappeared and he said I'm not ready for a relationship right now by text. <laughs> I was like, "Wait a minute, you're the one who pursued me." Um mm-hmm. but I don't want to be in a relationship with someone who does that. I that no, doesn't work for right. me. Right, no, so being in all. that chooser's seat, like you, when you have confidence, mm-hmm. you say, "Well, I don't, I don't want that. I want, I want right. someone who's going to be there, who's going to be consistent, whose words and actions match. You know, all those things that are so important. But when you don't believe in yourself, you think this is the best it gets. And boy, I'll tell you, dating from a place of value is just so completely different from dating from a place of desperation and um, yeah. scarcity. Um, yeah. So this is such such valuable information. Um, so Audrey, thank you for sharing all of this with us, and I'm sure there's tons more that people can learn from you. So so if you can let people know how they can find you, that would be great. Yes, Cindy, I'm on. Um, well, I have uh, my website is psychskills.com. It's p s y c h s k i l l s psych skills. Um, dot com and I have some free resources on there people can download having to do with dysfunctional thought patterns and one on how to not waste your life being angry depressed and anxious um, there's also information on there about working with me individually um, my book is available there through the site it just connects you to Amazon it's called dysfunction interrupted how to quickly overcome depression anxiety and anger starting now um, and I speak to groups women's groups um, church groups, whatever, do workshops and and the like like that. So um, anyone mm-hmm. wanting to get a hold of me, my phone number, all of my contact information is there. Or if they just Google me, Audrey Sherman, it comes up. I have a blog on Psych Central, and people can find me through that as well. Um, Wonderful. So Lots of resources. Be- <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much just Google me and something will come up. You'll go find me. Okay, well, thank you for sharing this this amazing wisdom with us and um, such a, such important work. So I, I hope that people will check out Psych Central and check you out and take advantage of some of your free resources and some of your paid resources. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show today, Audrey. Well, thank you, Sandy. Thank you for having me. It was very fun. Okay. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for listening, and I hope you go on your last first date very soon. Have a great day. Mm